Ladies and gentlemen, multiculturalism, making a thousand flowers bloom in partnership with Roland Berger. Please put your hands together for our esteemed group of panelists. First and foremost, Mr. Jalal Salahuddin, Partner and Creative Director, JNS Lahore, Pakistan. <laughs> Up next, we have Ms. Reena Dhaka, Fashion Designer. Can we, can we have a round of applause? A renowned fashion designer, Ms. Reena Dhaka. Up next, Dr. Isher Judge Aluwalia, Economist and Chairperson, ICR IER. Welcome, ma'am. And we have Mr. Swapan Das Gupta, Senior Journalist, as our moderator. Can we have a round of applause for Mr. Jalal Salahuddin, Partner and Creative Director, JNS Lahore, Pakistan. Welcome and over to you. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, we have a short sort of 35 minute duration, so I'll sort of dispense with certain formalities of introduction, which I think has already been done. Uh, it's reassuring that in a summit devoted principally to economic and business themes and issues of competitiveness and similar themes, we can also address some of the larger questions of culture, identity, and nationhood. And these are issues which, on the face of it, may not be terribly relevant for business, but I think it does form the larger background in which all of us lead our productive lives. And in India, in the past few years, some of these themes have surfaced in a very sometimes acrimoniously, sometimes less so. But the issue is really not confined to India. Even if you look at Europe, you'll find that the issue of multiculturalism, for example, has been very much an is a, a theme which has divided people. And in the United States, for example, if you look at the primaries which are being fought at present, you'll find that the issue of making America great, sometimes expressed in polite language and sometimes not so, is also a recurrent theme. So it's by no means a peculiarly Indian phenomena. But rather than discuss the whole issue in a global context, I think it would be worthwhile to discuss some of those issues. I mean, the, the, the field is really very, very vast. For example, the organizers have suggested five themes. Should we believe in a single idea of India? Does excessive freedom of expression go against the fabric of nationhood? Is it really possible to keep politics out of our textbooks? Is a liberal society still a few generations away? Are our educated young doing enough to build a multicultural society? What I think resonates through all these questions which the organizers have suggested as possible issues to be discussed is that I think the liberal ideal is, uh, the, li 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 the liberal vision is posited as the ideal, which some of us may or may not agree. I being a personally one who prefers to call myself a conservative would actually have a slight doubt over that. that. But I think the issues are important. And I think we'll touch upon these issues. I'll reserve my comments to tell about the last. And for the moment, I think we'll start, maybe I'll, I'll start with you, Rina, with this question of should we believe in a single idea of in India? And that would be interesting because I would urge you to 
So to reflect on this question, taking your personal experiences as a designer, as someone deeply involved with the fashion industry, and by implication, a lot of exports. Yes. Well, I mean, for me, I'm born here. I have my roots here. But my uh, grandmother and my father were from the pre-partition uh, era of, uh, like many of us here, from a region in Pakistan. And uh, what I know of tradition and culture is what I saw at home from uh, generations down to what I uh, moved in. But I also, as I spoke with you just now about the idea of a more integrated India now, have understood that in your next question, is that my next show I plan to do on a collection from Maharashtra. And I feel that I can do it. And it's going to be quite easy for me to access the zones and bring it back here to you. Um, on the other hand, because I practice Buddhism, I don't believe in this whole thing of having a, like, uh, because I'm an Indian, I must hate my neighbor because he's wronged us. I believe there's humanity everywhere and there's great good in all of us, whether it's this side of the earth or that side. So <laughs> I don't have this thing. I would rather improve on my own self as a human being than to be having this overzealous enthusiasm to be a nationalist. I don't know how to put it together. Well, that's interesting what you've just mentioned uh, because, you know, here you are experimenting with the art forms of Maharashtra, yeah. just as an example. And you could well be doing Bengal or you could be doing Tamil Nadu for an, another time. And I think here it brings to the question of the idea of India being multiple. But I think the question is, is there an overriding arch? I mean, as Indians, we also emotionally feel Indians while also believing, while also adhering to our local respective little identities. And they may be in the nature of a state, they may be in the nature of a faith, they may be some other things, political, it could be any other thing. It's your, in the context of this, in the question of multiple layers of identity, is there a need for an overarching view of India or views? Uh, well, Swapan, I also agree with Reena in what she has said, that I don't believe in a single idea of India. I think the richness of India, I believe in India, and I believe in India with its, its rich history, its rich diversity of languages, regions, cultures, uh, religions, and that's what makes us so special and so unique. We are an ancient civilization. We've evolved over the years integrating all these different aspects. And to me, that is what India is. Uh, you, know, you, know, you know, that's interesting. But to get Jalal into this very peculiarly Indian debate is perhaps a little unfair. And Jalal tells me that he has business interests in both Pakistan and India. He comes from a family which was politically active and not necessarily always on the side of the Muslim League. Uh, now, in looking at both issues, and I think Pakistan has its own issues of identity, India has its own concerns. How do you, as a maybe as a self-professed cosmopolitan, view these concerns? I think that um, identity um, is is a subjective thing and 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 I, and I think that individually speaking i'm not speaking as a pakistani or as as perhaps as a south asian or perhaps as, as a person who's you know interested in the world i would say that you 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 have to that is a journey and um you you cannot just simply um say yes i'm pakistani yes i'm muslim but i'm not religious i mean these are all things that that, that i may say to myself but but i feel that um ultimately Identity is meant to open up your horizons and open you up to the world. And uh, it can't be limiting. And what I find very interesting coming to India as a Pakistani is the multiplicity of, of this country, the syncretism of this country. I myself, for example, 
uh, I think that I, historically, coming from Lahore, am a, a product of the North Indian Ganga Jamuna culture, you know, because, because that, that, that is a culture that, that went across all the way from Ingol all the way to, to Afghanistan. And, and, and it created its own poetry, its own music, its own cultural interaction, its own richness. And uh, so, so in many ways, I see myself sitting here more as a South Asian than anything else. Yes, of course, I come from Pakistan. And uh, uh, one has one's own you know, issues there that deal with identity. But, but I feel that more than anything else, working between these two places and seeing them closely for the last two, two and a half years, I, I find the multiplicity of India very fascinating. And that is what attracts me to it. And that's what I've learned from as well, you know. So may I just, sorry, say something. I also think it's very judgmental when you identify a person with a kind of this, what are you? So I mean, we're humans is what I would say first. And citizens of the earth. Then it should be our whole, this booklet of survival, which says, it's like a tattoo. I but, uh, but at the same time, I think we should not um, fight shy of recognizing that each one of us has multiple identities. Yeah. I'm a woman, I'm a professional, I'm a mother, I'm an Indian, I'm a global citizen. So it doesn't limit you to have multiple identities. It actually strengthens each identity through the synergy that you bring like to When it. we cross borders, you have this very absurd question. I've never understood sex, male or female. How does it really help you? I mean, I, I don't get it. Now we have, we have a third one since, since Caitlyn Jenner, <laughs> you know, absolutely. So, you know, sometimes, I mean, let me inject a slightly controversial note to this discussion, otherwise it'll be become a little bit too stale. I've often found it that the, that the concerns over identity are peculiarly a North Indian phenomena. I was in Chennai last week for a talk, and one of the things I found very reassuring was how comfortable people are with their own respective identities in Chennai. And my friend Mohandas Pai, who's sitting here nodding very uh, in agreement, would say the same for Karnatak. And I would say sometimes it's the same for Bengal. So I've often been troubled, but is it that there is something in North India which is still evolving, or has North India been racked by too many political disturbances over the years, over the centuries, which, in a, which keeps the, the spot churning, which is why the, there is a sort of tentativeness about this. Isha, maybe you um, lived in sort of no, Calcutta as yeah. well as uh, Delhi, so yeah. you can... Well, Calcutta is different because... Oh, reassuring. <laughs> you know... It doesn't uh, work. Uh, uh, no, no, Calcutta, I mean, you know, it's really uh, intellectually oriented and you don't get many of these caste conflicts and all that you see in other parts of India. But as far as uh, the South is concerned, I would say not that uh, they never had it, but just they had it some decades ago and resolved to live with it or do whatever they wanted to do with it. And in the North, we are trying to, we are struggling to find a solution to it. And Mohan is again nodding. So I feel sort of happier. This is not based on any professional knowledge, but this is my sense of history of the South, that they've confronted this issue some decades ago. Shall I? I, I would tend to agree. I, I don't know as much about the South as you do. But I feel that if, historically speaking, with the amount of different uh, sort of, inv you can call them invaders or guests, or whatever you want, over the last couple of thousand years that, that the North has had, you know, starting the Aryans, the Greeks, the, you know, uh, Muslims, all kinds of people, the, the Central Asians, the Persians, you know, uh, even the Chinese. And uh, so I think that, that, that that's created a kind of palimpsest of history. And that palimpsest of history, you know, to quote the great Govidal, I think has, has created its own tensions. But also it's, it created a syncretic hetero heterogeneity in North India at the same time. So there was a counterbalance to both these things. And I think that one has to be cognizant of that fact. 
And, and of course, you have to work through those identities. I think now that there are three or four different nationhoods in what we call you know, the, the ancient North India, that itself has to be uh, 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 thought through by, by the p p politicians and the economists and the, uh, you know, the decision makers in those countries because, 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 because that syncretism, I think, should be revived in, in whether it's through trade or cultural exchange or politics or, or any, in any other way. I think that's where the tensions lie. In, in the modern context. Well, uh, Rita, sometimes it gives me the impression that there is another conflict which is there and part of this. That's the conflict between those who perceive themselves as cosmopolitan, yeah. sometimes they call the word global, and those who see themselves as far more rooted and comfortable in particular societies. And I think there is a very deep fault line which runs through that. And some of the assumptions which the cosmopolitans have, for example, are not necessarily shared. I, for example, don't see myself as a global citizen. I mean, yes, we are li living in the globe, so in, we are. But I'm quite happy with my Indian passport. I'm quite happy with my Bengali identity. I'm quite happy to be nominally a Hindu. And uh, it doesn't trouble me to flaunt any of them I sometimes sense that others are a little more squeamish about this. They want a melting pot somewhere. I don't know about this. There is, of course, many Indias. There's Cosmopolitan also, I think, has many grades in it. There is the, I mean, there's a yardstick of safety within which we can all survive, I feel. As a woman, I, when I grew up in India, and I go into a profession, and I know if I choose to wear an Indian outfit versus wearing a Western outfit, I'm subject to a different approach. My reactions towards my, um, I can sense the judgments behind the scenes or, or fast. So there is the, my version of your answer is that there is judgment at play at all times. But when it comes to this new passport thing, there is a lot of trauma. My sons are young. And recently, my young son was uh, returning from a holiday uh, in America. And he was subject to grueling uh, torture at customs for no fault of his. Reason being, he was accompanied by two friends. Uh, one from South India from a Muslim family and one from another one from another kind of a surname they couldn't identify. But it was harassing as parents for us to be feeling so helpless and to figure out how do we get these innocent children just traveling through a country on a holiday out of Northern North Carolina state where they entered in transit. So this whole nationalism, the whole world is coming towards this situation where they, you know, suspect a person with judgment based on no facts is what terrorizes me, to be honest, where the children are not safe by those who are meant to keep them safe. Yeah, that's interesting. Because this, this debate, for example, is very recurrent in Germany, for example. Now, Germany, as you well know, has been a society which has been defined. They've prided themselves on their sort of ethnic uniformity and also a cultural come linguistic uniformity. And here they've been now confronted with a wave of new immigration with people talking in different things, their different tongues, whose basic assumptions are very, very different. And it's produced a, it's producing a sharp reaction. So uh, do we sometimes, in the name of multiculturalism and the need to have enormous diversity, are we sometimes insensitive to the sense of rootedness? Isha? Um, um, let me talk of another divide. You said there is a global Indian and there's a rooted Indian. I would say there is a modern Indian and there is a traditional Indian. And ideally, what I would like to see is some melting point where the modernity can rid us of our superstitions and prejudice and especially as a woman, when I hear of Khap Panchayats doing what they are doing to save the honor of the families and what is being done to unborn little girls in Punjab, Rajasthan, and Gujarat, then to me, that is not saying that we are rooted. This is the non-global rooted Indian. So we should 
be comfortable in our skin about that. I am not. I think there is a modern Indian which has to keep his or her roots in India, but uh, aspire to live in a world in which we can raise our head with pride that we are equal citizens as women of this country. So that would be one example I would give of what I mean by a modern Indian. Yeah, well, that's the, you know, uh, Jalal, I'll just give you, a, I mean, I, I spent a lot of my formative years in the United Kingdom and uh, where naturally you had many Pakistani friends as well. And I recall one incident where one Pakistani gentleman came up to me and said, where are you from? And I said, I'm from India. And he said, I I'm from Pakistan. So I said, same thing. And he sort of glowered at me and said, oh no, it's not the same thing. Do we, and I've noticed that if there is anything which gets the backs of Pakistanis up, it's if you try and say, well, we are basically the same. Have you noticed this, that in trying to actually effect a bonding, we end up repelling each other? Oh, on the contrary, I've found yes. being here quite the opposite. Yes. And I, I would tend to agree with what you said, rather than, the, than, the, than, the, you know, than, than what, what the other gentleman said, simply because there's too much shared history. And you know, we can't start our history from 1947 onwards only. We need to, I mean, we're talking about thousands of years of history. And if we don't, I mean, for example, we were just talking earlier before, before the session started about the word India and the fact that it comes from Indus, which is yeah. the river Indus. And that is, of course, of course, you know, in Sindh, in Pakistan. And, and, and uh, you know, we were talking about, uh, uh, we were talking about clothes, I think, with, with Dina, and we were, we were saying that why, why is it that in both countries we have to sort of, you know, we're constantly, women especially, are constantly told to, to wear more, more fabric than less, whereas the dancing woman of Harappa and Mohanjodaro was, is naked. And, you know, that's one of our most ancient South Asian symbols that, uh, that we have. So, I personally feel that there is more similarity rather than, than, than division. And that's the only way we can, as modern individuals, like you're saying, move forward. I don't think there's any other way that we can move forward in. Secondly, I, I might add that I find it a little disconcerting sometimes when, uh, when and it's a very sort of perhaps Eurocentric, westernized uh, viewpoint uh, th that all of us Western educated people, people are imbued with, which, which says that multiculturalism, modernity, cosmopolitanism, all these words, you know, started with sort of the enlightenment and, and moved ahead from there. I think people who are cosmopolitan, multicultural, maybe not modern in, in the modern sense, but modern in, in the older sense, those things existed within this part of the world and, and, and in other parts of the world b b before these things became, you know, sort of part of the modern consciousness. And I think we can, and I agree with you, I think we can only be truly, truly citizens of the, of the world today if we embrace the modernity in, in, in our ancient traditions as well. You know, I don't see a division. I, I see a connection um, through, uh, you know, across borders and across time. Yeah, the sense of accommodation. I think we've talked enough, but there must be sort of questions among the, with the audience. Which, uh, it's, after all, an uh, interplay of ideas and perceptions. So, gentlemen over there. Ken, is it sensible to judge an individual's patriotism on the basis of four words? Thank you. I think he means Bharat Mata Ki Jai. That's what you mean? Yeah. Well, my answer... well, you should say it. I mean, I, I, are you afraid of uttering the words? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I'll leave it to the others, but I would probably have a slightly contrarian view from the rest of the panel, because I think the, there is a certain iconography of India. There is an inheritance in India which suggests that India is sacred. It's a belief which predates modernity. It is based on the notion of sacred geography, as we call it. And... The image of Bharat Mata, which actually emerged, which came into the public realm more in the 19th century, has been very much a part of thing. Now, whether we, it has been subsumed by something called constitutional patriotism, 
is really the debate which is really going on at present. Some of the articulation of this debate may be a little crude, but underlying it is this thing. Do we see our country as sacred or not? At least that's my vision. Isha, you must be having a very different take. Well, let me take it a step forward and say, you know, you don't give women equal rights to live in the society, but you want to put Mata on the pedestal, and then you want to put Bharat Mata, and say Bharat Mata ki jai. First, give us our rightful place within our families. Don't rape our girls. Don't uh, make the uh, uh, lives of working women impossible because you can't give them law and order. We don't want to be matas. We are all proud to be mothers. But I think we should really try and live by some basic values that this country has. All the rest is subsidiary. And of course, I'm a proud Indian. I want to be a uh, proud Indian. But don't judge me by words. Judge me by deeds, by yeah. what I want to do for my country, what I want to make my country. You know, by uh, focusing on these words, one way or the other, we are distracting energy, which should be directed at making our country greater. That would be my response. Wow. Uh, I, I sir, personally think that uh, to be an Indian is a kind of an identity, to explain where you come from, your region, and home. But peace is the most important thing. And from my perspective, every government which came or comes will put a slogan. It's a kind of a catchy thing, I think, to kind of get an identity with of their own. And um, as you know, we have most tribes and nations, I don't know if I'm as accurate as all of you in knowledge, do worship the land as their mother or father in some uh, countries. It is considered sacred. But I think if there is peace between regions, especially uh, between us. And Jalal did say just the same sentence, what you said to the person you met in England, the exact same, we are the same to me and him just now. And I said the same when I went to Karachi. There is really no difference. So because we eat, think, and speak the same language most of the time. So uh, I would say if there's peace, there's stability, like you, she said, and there's safety, then we would all prosper. Our lives would be safe. And that, to me, is being an Indian more than screaming a slogan. Well, I don't know about eat the same, but uh, I, I certainly don't have any attachment for butter chicken. <laughs> uh, but uh, looking at it from with a relative sense of detachment, this is really a domestic Indian controversy at present. How would you look at it? Um, well, I couldn't really answer it, obviously, as an Indian. But, but I would imagine thinking about it as a Pakistani, if, if I were to try and if we were to have a uniform sort of slogan uh, about how we feel about, about our identity, mine would be different to my friends in Lahore and somebody else's. And that's the only way I could answer it. It would be difficult for me. To, to, to find a unitary identity to describe myself as Pakistani, I would say. Gentlemen here. Yeah, I'm Sabir. My question is to Jalal. Uh, how would you uh, react to this uh, recent incident which took place in Pakistan? where a boy was jailed because he flew the Indian flag and you're the fan of Virat Kohli. So what would be your take on this? Oh, I, I haven't, I'm, I'm afraid I haven't heard about it, but I don't think anybody should be jailed for their views, personally. Whatever they, they may be, I feel that, you know, um, for example, I was just reading up on McCarthyism in the United States and the amount of people that were incarcerated creative people, and I can only talk, talk as a creative person because I'm, because I'm the creative director of my company, that, you know, cre creative ideas can take you across the world and, and, and can make you, to, uh, ma make you want to, you know, do things in, in all kinds of different ways. So I feel that whenever you try and, 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 and limit any kind of expression, it's not a good thing. And, and we should be comfortable in our, in our own identities and in our own societies not to limit any kind of creative expression. 
or any kind of expression per se, as long as it's not violent. Hi. Uh, my question really is um, as to why, the reason for why we are having this debate. If you look at a country like the US, um, it's a melting pot. Many people from different countries come there culturally. Loud uh, you can't hear me? No, no, we can. Uh, from a religious uh, perspective. Uh, but we don't have these kind of debates in the US as to what is uh, an American and you know, what does it mean to be uh, coming from different cultures? Why are we even having this debate in India? Uh, you've not obviously been following the Trump debates. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm talking about debates in panels about, you know. Uh, I don't know. My knowledge of the United States is very tangential. It's I not think, a place I like to I go. I think you've, you've answered the question. I think under stress, a lot of that is coming out in the US also. So I don't think we are unique, but that doesn't mean that we should have them. Your point is well taken. My view is we must avoid this tendency to have an overarching Indian identity. We are a collection of 29 countries. We are very different, let's be clear. We are joined together by common values, common civilization, etc. And this idea of an Indian that you speak about, an idea of an India that you speak about is very different to very different people. This conversation makes no sense to people in the South. Because for us, Pakistan is irrelevant to our lives. For you, it's very relevant because of partition, shared culture, shared memories. Right? For us, something else is more relevant. For Bengal, I'm sure, East Bengal is relevant, not Pakistan. So when you speak about this overarching identity, the idea of India, once we accept, like Europe, we are a collection of 29 countries, like Europe, there's an European identity, there's a German identity, and we are different, and we accept it, and we accept, like Aisha said, all of us are very multiple identities, all identities are very important. A caste identity is important. A region is important. A language is important. And all have to be invested in and avoid the tendency to group everybody and say, Bharat Mata ki jai, because Bharat Mata doesn't resonate with me. It resonates with you. I mean, I'm sorry about that in the north. So let's, we, we have to have this diverse view. Then I think we solve the problem. We don't have to compartmentalize in one single identity because it doesn't exist. Ma'am, uh, Reena Dhaka, you see, there is a price to be paid for security. I will draw your attention to a young boy of Hyderabad, son of a general who was uh, involved in certain matters which were not right for the country. Threat perceptions are different for different countries, and uh, same thing will apply to India. Now, if your son has undergone inconvenience, now this is the price which has to be paid. We cannot be selective because he is your son, he should be given good treatment. America has different type of threats, so they don't bother who is who. Now, can you imagine what can happen if security agencies ignore all people who are of a particular age and expose the country to different type of threats. Sir, the, my son and his friends were being judgmentalized by, uh, there was a, just a group of check-in. There is nothing in their handbags, they're students. So if the security agencies would judgmentalize them on the ethnic names on the basis of their et ethnic identities, that would mean that they would subject all of us to suspicion, uh, the entire country literally, in their eyes. And it would be correct of them to do so because we then become a kind of a threat to all of them when we are not. So I personally think it's, uh, it's based on their perceptions which are very narrow-minded. Well, this entire question of racial profiling, which yes. is really what you're talking about, is, is, is really... Well, that's really what happened to them. Whether it actually enhances security or, uh, in a sense, leads to a countervailing danger is something which is being tried. Uh, gentleman there. Thank, thank you, sir. 
So um, uh, I, I just want to kind of share an observation. Uh, I think, uh, you know, we, we are constantly asking ourselves, uh, you know, whose India is this, or the idea of India. And uh, typically, uh, you know, there is a dichotomy, uh, there is a, you know, polarity here, where we talk about, on, on the one end, uh, we, uh, we have, you know, imported the idea of nationhood, uh, uh, unitary nationhood uh, from Europe, and that kind of wove into our anti-colonial struggle. Uh, that's one side. And the other side, if, if you deny uh, that unitary idea of a unitary nation, then um, those people who deny that are accused of uh, believing in, uh, you know, Metternich's idea of Italy, which uh, he referred to as a geographical expression. And the British also, uh, many of them believed India is just a geographical expression and not a united nation uh, as the idea of a nation, uh, you know, uh, is as it was woven in the 19th century. So, uh, you know, my submission is that, uh, you know, it's been 70 years uh, of independence and India needs to uh, grow out of that polarity and realize that uh, India is extremely rich and, uh, you know, needs to define itself in a, in a more calibrated idea of a nation. And, uh, you know, uh, also uh, would like to s submit here something controversial that the Indian civilization has been united for last many thousand years by certain ideas. One of them is caste. And, uh, you know, and caste is such a pervading influence which we generally deny in the na when we talk about a unitary nation because whether it is among the Hindus, whether it is among people who left the Hindu fold and embraced Islam, so there is still caste between the Ashrafs and the Atraps, uh, people who became Buddhists uh, to escape caste, but it still pervades over there because there are uh, a category of Buddhists called Neres in Bengal who are discriminated against, whether it is among Sikhs, because there are people who are Mazhabi Sikhs and they are discriminated against by others. So this is controversial, but at the same time, it's an idea which unites uh, the entire subcontinent. Yes, sir, I think we've got the so, point. Yeah, sure. Uh, the board out there is flashing time is up. Uh, may, I, may I just yes, add one sir. thing here? Because we're talking about identity, and I, it suddenly occurred to me that the, another identity that we have to think about as South Asians is, is our common South Asian identity, simply because in today's world of climate change and all kinds of things that are, that, that are, that, that are extra national and that, that, are, that are not related to, to the nation in South Asia, these are the challenges that we need to address as South Asians. These are our common you know, problems that will need to be addressed by our coming generations. And I think it's important through one's own national identity or any identi other identity that we're talking about here to talk, to, to find a commonality in our South Asian identity so that these problems can be resolved so that all of us can benefit. And, you know, and, we, and that we create, we create a South Asia where, 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 you know, life is viable for the poor especially and the downtrodden. Any final thoughts, Isha? Well, um, you know, uh, I'm not sure what to make of that comment that yes, caste is something which a lot of us share in different parts of India, but to call that the uniting factor, I think in fact, that's what we need to get rid of if we want to become a modern nation. I know that all political parties have also embraced caste and we are working in that uh, uh, you know, uh, manner, but uh, if we want to really realize our economic and social potential as a country, we will just have to learn to leave caste behind and make a more united, modern India for all classes, for all genders to come together and participate in that. Veena? Well, I thank your friend, Mr. Pai, because what you said is what I could not explain <laughs> when this topic was explained to me, that I don't want to say that I am not proud to be an Indian. What I'm trying to say is that just as you believe we are, this is like Europe, you know, and we are Indian, and then we have all our distinct, um, you know, the divides which make us unique. So thank you. You sort of gave me an answer I will probably use if asked again. As a final comment, I'm sorry, sir, but the time is really up, and we just close in about a minute or so. You know, I, I quite found it, I found it extremely troubling 
when this debate on the idea of India was introduced into the public arena around 2014, the reason for it is we in India have survived on the strength of unspoken and multiple assumptions, some of which are very nebulous, some of which are part of what might be called common, uh, commonly understood sensibilities which cannot be articulated. In trying to codify it, you end up creating a lot of divisions. Certain things are best felt, appreciated, rather than actually theorized. And this theorizing is a big curse of some of modern academia in, into society today. And just as the final thing about the efficacy of India, after the Kargil War in 1999, I was in Pakistan for a brief visit, and among the various people, I spoke to was a very, very colorful gentleman who died some years ago, a head of the ISI, a chap called, uh, what gul was he? Hamid Gul. Hamid Gul, thought to be a very, very, bit of a fruitcake uh, in, in his own way. Now, he was very angry because he felt Pakistan had suffered a humiliation in Kargil. And he said, you know, unless we can defeat you economically, unless we can break your country, we will always be the loser. And that's, that's a very extreme statement. And therefore, some people who talk about the idea of India in security terms would get reinforced by the idea that, yes, we need a doctrine to uphold it because there is a foe. And it's the sense of adversity which sometimes defines our thing. If this adversity was to go, in some way, I'm not suggesting there is a magic recipe. If we don't see an other, I think we'd be far more relaxed in the way we see ourselves and how society, we see the world, and we'd be far more comfortable with ourselves in the process. Thank you very much. It's been a very wonderful and stimulating discussion. Can we have a much bigger round of applause? That was uh, truly enlightening and very thought-provoking. I would request Mr. Pai to kindly grace the stage and present the mementos to our esteemed panelists. First and foremost, Ms. Reena Dhaka. We could do with a round of applause. Up next, Dr. Alu Alia. Mr. Jalal Salahuddin. and Mr. Swapan Das Gupta.